Hi, Mr. Arbitrage here, and it looks like CNBC is finally waking up to the fact that the commodities market, especially oil, is in a bubble. I mean, it's absolutely amazing. If there's one culprit in this bubble, if there's one singular reason or person that could be to blame, it would have to be the Federal Reserve. I mean, it's absolutely amazing. I don't think it's, I think it's unprecedented. I don't think there's been any time in history where we've had bubbles of this magnitude, three of them consecutively within about a decade, actually over the past 12 years. And we're hearing the same reasons, the same excuses, no matter what the price of oil is right now, to justify oil when it was at hitting new records at 50 and 60, as what we were hearing at 70 and 80 and 90 and 100 and 130, there is no sophisticated due diligence going into this. If you, were, if you were to take a chart of Federal Reserve policy on interest rates, say from 1995, around the beginning of the bull market, the tech internet bubble, and ran it all the way through to today, you would be amazed at how the federal monetary policy has coincided with each and every bubble, including this one. In each and every case, going back to the mid-90s, at the beginning of the tech bubble, interest rates were at post-World War II levels, unnaturally low, and that led to leverage where you had millions of inexperienced investors buying stocks on margin. They had no idea what the consequences were, but they were buying twice as much stock as they could afford, driving up the prices, and then you had the, the comments irrational exuberance by Alan Greenspan and the Fed began to take rates down and then we had the market correction and after the market correction the Federal Reserve again was afraid of the economy going into recession so the after September 11th took interest rates once again down to those historic lows so now people lost half of their money in tech stocks you have interest rates at historic lows. They're afraid of the stock market because they had no idea what they were doing. So they're looking for the next big thing that they could lose their money in. Enter the real estate bubble. They're out there, everybody's quitting their jobs just like they did in the tech and they're becoming real estate developers overnight and they're leveraging themselves with all this ersatz money thanks to the Federal Reserve buying way more house or way too many houses way more than they, they could ever afford or knew what to do with, then we have, oh my, interest rates are start to go up again. Then we have the real estate bubble collapse, thanks to higher interest rates finally, cooling it down. And now here we are in this past year, the Federal Reserve of course is worried about the economy going into recession. Here we are again at historic low interest rates. Here we are again with unprecedented amounts of money pouring in, leveraging into the commodities bubble because the baby boom generation is not going to be content until they lose every last cent of their inheritance that was earned and left to them by their parents. It's amazing when you look at this bubble and every other bubble, in each one there was a mantra that the, cre the credulous investors, the irresponsible investors, had to use to justify their lunacy. Back in the tech internet bubble, it was a new paradigm and the old rules didn't matter. The, the world was gonna change and that was true. In each one of them, there's some truth, but none of them really justifies the current valuations. In the real estate bubble, of course, the baby boomers were going to retire. So they're gonna move south and to Florida and they're gonna move to Vegas and Arizona. Well, that's all true but nobody was doing any due diligence to justify how many baby boomers are gonna to move to these places and how many are we actually gonna build. There was no correlation between the capacity and the actual number that we're moving. You had all these different developers building these skyscrapers of condominiums on the beaches. Now we've got skyscraper after skyscraper from Jacksonville to Miami that are empty. There's nobody filling them up. And who's going to pay for them and what are we going to do with them now? Nobody was checking to see how many of their competitors were going to build. 
I don't know what we're going to do with all these condos. There aren't enough people behind the baby boom generation to fill them up. I mean, an enterprising developer might put bars on the windows and try to outsource them to the state or federal penitentiary system. As our, they say our prisons are overcrowded. Maybe we could have some oceanfront prisons here in Florida. That'll replace our tourism industry. But then we've got the oil bubble. The mantra that they kept repeating throughout this oil, the oil bubble is China is using more oil and OPEC is not, is not increasing their output. Therefore, any price can be justified. They've been saying that all the way up from 50. When 50 was overvalued, they were still saying, well, China, China is using more and more. We don't have enough refineries. We're running our refineries at 97 percent, blah, blah, blah. Well, now here we are at $130 a barrel. If there's really so much demand, then why are our refineries, why are our refineries working at 80% capacity? Because there isn't enough demand to justify the prices. That's why. They can use those, yes, China is using more oil, but they were way back then too. I don't care what's going on in Nigeria on a, a pipeline attack. There's some there needs to be some sort of due diligence to justify the current prices, other than Goldman Sachs just coming out claiming it's going to 200. There's no due diligence by these people to support how the $200 a barrel price target correlates to reality. Any imbecile could come out and be avant-garde and, and arbitrarily pick a price and be a hero for a few months. And that's what we have here. And when it hits 200, they'll say 300. If it hits 300, they'll call for 400. But there's never any reasoning. There is no sophisticated amount of due diligence going into these numbers. It's a bubble, plain and simple. But at least with the stock market bubble, intelligent people could elect not to play. They could buy value-oriented companies or they could not buy the stocks at all. With real estate, the victims didn't have to be the innocent because if you didn't want to pay an outrageous amount for a house, you could rent and get a better deal. Unfortunately, with the oil bubble, we are all being victimized by the credulity and the greed of these speculators. Interest rates have got to go higher. There's too much money out there, too many investors trying to get a return, and that's what led to each bubble. They couldn't get a return in sound investments if you try to put your money in anything safe, your money is going to be undermined by inflation and taxes. So they're forced into more speculative issues. So now you've got this loose money policy, cheap money, and nowhere to get a good return except by speculation. And until the Federal Reserve starts increasing interest rates, inflation is going to run away in Carter-esque fashion. And we're going to see the whole world suffer as oil prices go through the roof at, at prices that have no correlation to intrinsic value and reality. If not analysts. If you look at the most prominent industry leaders, they say intrinsic value of oil is about $60 per barrel. Now the analysts are a different story. They just want to be the next hero to predict a new high. So they're willing to arbitrarily pick a new high. They're trying to outdo each other by predicting new highs that, that have no relationship to intrinsic value. Are we at the top at 130? Who knows? Probably not. It reminds me of a quote by the Roman orator Cato, who once said, there certainly must be a vast fund of stupidity in human nature, else men would not be caught as they are a thousand times over by the same snare. And while they yet remember their past misfortunes, go on to court, encouraging the causes to which they were owing and which will again produce them. If there's one thing that we learn from history, it's that we never learn from history. I'm Mr. Arbitrage. Stay golden.